Welcome to Tony Talks. Welcome to Tony Talks. Welcome to Tony Talks. So yeah, this this is Antonio Moore Welcome coming to, to you Talks. from Tone Talks. Welcome to Tone I have the wonderful Joshua Welcome Poe, urban planner, winner of uh, the Harvard Map Award for what he did in Louisville, showing redlining. Um, I brought him on because uh, we met sometime this year at Louisville while we were doing something for the Angela Project, which is about reparations with uh, Dr. Kevin Cosby and the city of Louisville. But what I wanted to do today was to have a discussion not only about his works that he's seen in Louisville and beyond about redlining, but about the book, The Color of Law, and the and, uh, interview I recently did with Richard Rothstein. I wanted to get his opinions. Uh, you want to say hello to the audience? Hello, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Really honored to be on your show, Antonio, and uh, 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 can't wait to get started. So let, let, let's get right into it. You know, the first question I'm going to ask of a series of questions is, what are your thoughts on the color of law, the book, and what is redlining after you answer that? Okay, well, um, first of all, I think it's a, I think it's a tremendous book. I think it's a great book. I think the book really, uh, you know, supports Rothstein's objective of, of really explaining how this was, uh, these were federal policy. And, and if you really listen to Mr. Rothstein, his, his, his point is that since these were policies created by the federal government rather than private entities then the federal government have, has an obligation to intervene. So and I think the book does a great job of displaying that. De facto versus de jure. De facto versus de jure. But I think by only explaining that, it doesn't really contextualize redlining. And I think there's a danger in looking at redlining as a historical practice. So one of the things I've tried to do with my work is really destroy any notion that this is history that this created a system that we're still operating in, and that system is white supremacy. Uh, so we don't need to be surprised that we're getting white supremacist outcomes in the current real estate market. A lot of feedback loops were created by redlining. A lot of uh, 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 implicit bias was created in the data so that uh, uh, now that, that, that we can, now we can use objective data to discriminate, but it's, it's still de facto. So... Yeah. So, so let, let, let's let's look at just for the audience members that might not understand redlining. It, you know, basically, black people became a contagion for wealth itself. If a black person moved into a neighborhood, it destroyed the the value because all of a sudden, government backed loans were no longer A level for that neighborhood; they were F level. So you move a black person in, and everybody's property value d goes down. In addition, of course, black people themselves can't get approved for loans, so, th so thus they can't be part of the rising America that every other white person is able to be part of, particularly in the top 20 to 30 percent of white America. But in specifics, what is redlining? Maybe you can explain it even better. Well, redlining specifically is what you just described. It was the it was a practice by the homeowners loan corporation where they were going to the one hundred or the two hundred and fifty largest cities in the country and making home loans, really creating the suburbs, deciding how those cities would, would be valued, how the property would be valued in those cities. Uh, so specifically that's what it was. And they had a color coded system on their maps, uh, A B C D D being the lowest grade. Uh, and that was the, the red, you know, it was green, yellow, blue, and red. D was red. The black neighborhoods were invariably red neighborhoods. However, when I talk about redlining, I use redlining more of, as an anchor term to describe a series of policies beginning around 1917, 1918, including zoning, redlining, urban renewal, and in interstate highways. And when I describe those policies, I'm talking about a, a, a structural violence against the black community. And these were policies were, and, and the reason that's important to talk about is because I think sometimes academics and even Richard Rothstein miss the real intentionality behind these policies. These policies were created as a form of structural violence against black communities. They were weaponized against black communities. And I think the word contagion that you use is a really apt word. I've been looking for a word to describe that because talking about how black people were denied access doesn't really accurate, doesn't really describe exactly the exact situation. So in 1924, uh, the federal government convened a, the Hoover Commission on Zoning. Herbert Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce then, and out of that commission, uh, they determined that black people were a threat to property values. 
that was at the federal level. I think it was 1924. Uh, and that's exactly what you're describing. Black people, their very presence, their very geography, the human space that they occupy was determined, it was deemed that they were a threat to other people, not just not just their own wealth, but other people's wealth if they were lived in proximity to them. Come on. And so, so you know, you have this interesting dynamic. We talked about this offline where black bodies, you know, Yale historian um, um, said that in, in Tana Hosey Coates' piece that uh, black bodies were worth more than all the land, all the railroads, all the manufacturing together. We move from a system where black bodies hold the most wealth to now when black bodies control their own like wealth, all of a sudden we're going to make black bodies destroy wealth in this new system. So fundamentally, black people really didn't get a chance to be part of America. And now I think are required to have that wealth like like they were part of the whole time. Meaning you need that wealth to pay for college, to uh, buy a new home, to have your kids transition into, fund into a functional American life today. And that brings me to my second question, which is if white America weaponized, and this is, this is where I think Rothstein went wrong and me and him have went back and forth on this point. If white America weaponized the advantage from redlining, so you buy a house, for fifteen thousand dollars, for twenty thousand dollars, that house appreciates in Los Angeles, in New York, to five hundred, to six hundred, to eight hundred thousand dollars. Everything in our lives is based on the presumption you have that money. That's why college is high. College wouldn't be high if white people couldn't pay for it. And so, what I wonder is, if if that is now weaponized, and when I say weaponized, white communities we see with Philando Castile. Who, who the policing comes from a neighborhood watch center. You know, they sit down in a council and they say, we want you to watch this corner for uh, thugs, you know, thugs. Or, or for that matter, Ferguson with the ticketing schemes. You know, we want police. We don't want to pay property tax for them. Over ticket the black folk that live over there. And so if white America weaponized the advantage from redlining, is it correct to just focus on the government policy versus looking at these individual white Americans who really want to keep their whiteness? No, and that's, and that's where I think looking at it as a federal policy falls a little short because what redlining was was a public-private partnership. It was a federal – the maps were actually done by the federal government in collusion with local real estate interests. So the federal government comes into every large city in the country, medium-sized city, and they the consultants that made the maps were local consultants working with the federal, federal government. So it was done for the banks. It was done so, – so, for instance, here in Louisville, the, the real estate entities that created those maps are still in operation in Louisville. They benefited from that financially. Uh, and, and I would take it a step farther to even say that not only uh, were blacks a contagion in this process, but white wealth is act, was actually contingent upon how well they could exclude black people from the process. So. Uh, for, so let me, I can unpack that. So, for instance, in the Louisville maps, and it says this in a lot of the maps, it says the current home values were not the guiding factor in the grading. So what that means is, is we're not basing anything on any free market uh, uh, principles that are existing at that time. The, the, the biggest factor in the Louisville maps was how well those homes were deed restricted. So explain the, that. Explain that. You deed restricted. So deed restrictions were put on deeds during that time that prohibited the sale of property to black people. There were a lot of restrictions. Only black people or Native Americans too or Mexicans so, too? Sometimes you would see other groups, sometimes the, uh, uh, deed restrictions, but that doesn't come close to describing. Uh, 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 they, they would say one or two things. They would say these homes can only be sold to people of Caucasian descent. They would say things like that. Sometimes they would say... Uh, these homes could not be. This home could not be sold to anyone of African descent. Something like that. But, but looking through, you know, you know, doing tons of research on this, black people were the targets of, of the deed restrictions more often than. And when we're talking about black people, we're talking about descendants of slaves. There were no Africans here. Very yeah, small so, amounts of Caribbeans. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, but that's that's how that was the wording in the in the in the, in the document a lot of times. So the, the neighborhood that was ranked the highest in Louisville was the Mockingbird Valley Indian Hills neighborhood during that time. Those were not the highest priced homes in Louisville by, by any means, but they had the most, they had the highest restrictions. And what was happening during that time, a lot of these restrictions were expiring. And 
the NAACP was targeting deed restrictions in court. So people knew, like, this is this is eventually going to be overturned by the Supreme Court. So they knew that the, the newer subdivisions would have longer-lasting restrictions. So they ranked those neighborhoods higher. So a neighborhood with some of the highest property values in the 30s in Louisville was Shawnee Park. Shawnee Park was a white, affluent neighborhood, but it was next to a black neighborhood. So what happened was, 10 years after that, white people that own homes in Shawnee Park, their property values did not accelerate at the same pace as the property values in Mockingbird Valley and Indian Hills after Red Line. So what's a white person do in Shawnee Park? They get out of there. They move farther out. And you see how the suburbs were really created based on black people being a contagion in this process. If you live close to a black neighborhood, your property values are not increasing at the same rate. Even though 10 years ago you had the, you had the uh, uh, highest property values in the city. That's one of the legacies of redlining, and that's really what facilitated white flight. We don't talk about that a lot in, in, in how it created white flight and created the suburbs and created urban sprawl and created, you know, this sort of helped help create along with FHA, along with the other policies, you know, this, this, this entire notion of whiteness. A lot of the immigrant groups that moved into those suburban homes, they were not really considered white prior to suburbanization. But all of a sudden, they all become white. What type of immigrant groups are we talking about? Italian immigrant groups, uh, 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 German immigrants, a lot of people that had came over uh, from Europe in the early, you know, like 1900, 1905, 1910. A lot of people don't, they don't know that there were trials to make these people white. Uh, you know, they literally had court cases to fight themselves into normalcy, you know, and it's interesting in, in so many ways because... You know, I look at, at Rothstein in the light of, of Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, and I see this attempt to make this a class argument in a country that has rooted itself in the destruction of black people's lives and black wealth and black bodies. When in reality, you know, class limits the discussion, it doesn't expand it. And I, I come to the question that I ask you, not only about Rothstein, Sanders and Warren and, and, and the fallacies in their approach, but also does white America have to give up whiteness for there to be any progress on race? Well, that's, that's a good question. And, and, and before we can answer that, I want to talk about a little bit like what that whiteness is. What that whiteness is, is privilege and power and, and, and control. Uh, so when I say that these policies were a history of structural violence against the black community, uh, the flip side of that is white people benefiting from it. So yes, by all means, white people are going to have to be stripped of some of that privilege and power and control, and and a debt really has to be paid to the black community that that that, that, that war has really been waged on for the last one hundred, well, you know, in urban America, one hundred years uh, that they've benefited from, uh, and we just have to get real honest about that moving into two thousand nineteen, and you know, of course, class is important. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing activist work now for over tw almost 20 years of, from being a frontline protester, community organizer, and I don't really believe we can tackle any issue unless black liberation is really at the forefront of, of every movement. Um, and, 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 that, and that includes poverty. I mean, black liberation really has to be the, the focal point of, 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 of our movement in this country because we just uh, we can't move forward until we deal with that. And it's interesting because I look at the works of, of, of Sandy Darity and I did a report with him. I sent that over to you. And one of his findings out of Duke is is that the lowest quintile like of white people still are worth $10,000. You don't find that until you get to somewhere in the middle for black folks. And I, I think that middle of black families. Um, so I'm talking in terms of, of wealth. And so I find it very interesting about when we start dealing with white fragility and we start dealing with the need to make white people feel good. Cause I, I feel like that is one of the breaks that I had with Rothstein in the interview is this fundamental desire to say that we're not going to get any progress unless we bring white people along as they are with everything that they have, which is everything in America. And so that means that we won't have progress at all. I don't know if he understood that circle. And I come to the, come to come back to it and say, when we look, let, let, let's get more specific. Do you think that Rothstein, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders really understand that Ferguson is built on the black of black people failing? Like it doesn't feel that way to me. I, I don't know what they understand or what or, or not. I do know this. I know when, when I give my presentation, I've had the most resistance within academia. Um, 
within academia and that, and that sort of white progressive mindset, it's very difficult for them to accept the intentionality behind these policies. Uh, it's almost as if there's a need to explain it in another uh, another way that doesn't get to that sort of intentionality that you're talking about. And I think there's a reason for that, I think, because acknowledging – it's one thing to acknowledge history and say, hey, some mistakes were made that we can't correct. It's something very different to acknowledge to say, hey, this is this is still happening today with, an, with the same intention and purpose uh, – because what that means is that we have to drastically alter our society at the systems level. We have to really deal with root causes, and that's a much different conversation. And we, so and, I don't know and we start to and we start to see that when we look at the wealth data. I've done work with Matt Brunig out of demos. He pulls the micro data unlike anybody else on the, on the net. He found uh, 90 percent of the wealth is in white hands. Two point six percent is in in uh, black hands, and we don't even know how much of that is in foreign black hands. You know. You see that also within Black America, pretty much all of our wealth, 75% of that 2.6 is in the top 10% of families, All almost all boomers, not athletes, entertainers. The other thing that's very interesting about the Black group is there's been this nuanced attempt by white fragility and white capital to use decadent veil covers. I call it the decadent veil, whether it be celebrity or biracials. And biracials are problematic because... When we talk about white privilege, if you are Tracy Silberstein, Tracy Ellis Ross from Blackish, and your father is white, how are you any different if you inherit the same privilege? We're trying to see and track the, the, the cost of having two parents that descend from American slavery. Is that producing any success in this America? And so often what we see is that Obama is another example. He inherited $400,000 liquid from his white grandmother. And so in the end, you're a Kenyan with a white grandmother and you inherit $400,000. I don't think there's a thousand black people in this country that will that will inherit that amount of wealth, but you inherit it as a white person, basically. I'm not dealing with how you sound or look. And America doesn't want to deal with the middle of, of black America. The other finding of the data from uh, Brunig is that the bottom half of black America combined isn't worth a dollar. Like when you look at the, the amount of debt versus wealth, they basically come out net zero almost. And I think now we have to understand why, not only why is that the case, but how systemically purposeful that was. And how does redlining tie to the fact that black people don't have wealth today? Before I go to the third question. Well, if you look back at the redlining maps, the, the consultants that made the maps talk about this very explicitly. What they say is, for instance, in the, in, in the Louisville document, and they say this in a lot of the cities, is they say, we don't mean to imply that mortgages can't be made in black neighborhoods. What they say is, is that, but they need to be made and serviced on a different basis. So very explicitly, redlining created two economies. Uh, a cast. A cast. A cast. Yeah, exactly. It's a very so a cast. That's exactly it. And one of the and one of those economies, black people were completely excluded from, shut out of, and like you said, not just shut out of, but were actually a, their very existence was a threat to wealth creation within that system. And it's and in. And it still happens today. We have risk factors and credit scores that deny black people access to capital based on the feedback loop created from redlining. A realtor in Cleveland recently made a map that looked a lot like the redlining map. And he defended himself by saying, look, I'm not a racist. I created all this off of objective data. But if you overlay his map, this is the largest uh, commercial multifamily developer in Cleveland. The, the lines and the overlays line up perfectly with the Cleveland's redlining data. And the interesting thing is, um, two part, before I go to the next question, we, saw, we see the same thing with the racial dot map. I shared with you a new story came out um, that when you look at the, the racial dot map, which shows where, where blacks, whites, Latinos, and Asians live by dot, there's these odd spaces in the middle of white suburban parts of America of just green dots. And what they found is that those tend to be prisons. Because as, as I've stated before, there are more African-American men incarcerated than all women on the planet. 20 million black males produce more prisoners than 4 billion women on this whole planet that descend from slavery. And our society is not really being honest about that. We're, 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 we're talking about being for, about a forgotten history. We're talking about a, a, a yesterday when that stuff is in today. So that brings me to a bit of data that leads me into this third question. We you know, one of the other things me and Brunig did, and I, I kind of pushed Brunig to pull the micro data and show us specifics in a way that we've never seen. And we did an article together. What we found is that 
of, of the there's 83 or between it depends on how you count a household between 83 to 88 million white homes and what you find is that a full 15 percent of those homes are worth a million or more and you also find that almost a million white homes are worth more than 10 million dollars understand there are 20 million black homes half of them are worth nothing nearly nothing understand that only 350,000 with their pension in their house break a million dollars and we're talking about 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 mostly. These are boomers too. They're not working age people. Not I'm not even dealing with the consequence of what that is going forward, but I start to under like look at this thing and one of the theories that I have is black America is going to face an aspiration problem, which means America now has built itself under the presumption that if you're going to achieve high-end goals, I don't care if it's a movie producer, I don't care if it's opening a business, that you have the wealth that came from being advantageously positioned because of redlining. So now I ask the question, has America built the cost of being a, being a, a white redline winner, that's what I kind of call it, into being American? That, so everybody says, you know, college is expensive. Is it if you, if you benefited from redlining? Is it expensive if you can go into your equity of your home and pull that money out? Isn't, is that presumed now? And if you don't have that, you're out. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it, people. I mean, it, we talk about how millennial, millennials are a lot more challenged than boomers. But however, uh, millennials are still white. Millennials are still being. They're still successful. Uh, they can still afford. Uh, you know, they may not. We none of us may be able to live the way boomers live. Uh, but they're doing pretty well. You know. Um, so those things are not expensive. I mean, the, the, the wealth that was created through redlining is still being passed down through the generations, and those same people are still benefiting. Uh, and they're going to benefit. Uh, like I said, maybe... And, and what's happening now with millennials, uh, as opposed to boomers, is that black neighborhoods are now being revitalized and gentrified for millennials. So there's this... this, this it's, it's, it's really... It's almost like a game of Monopoly, and it's very sad, because now what's happening is not only have black people... Uh, uh, been a contagion in this process for decades, but now that when their neighborhood, when when investment comes to their neighborhood, they're not even able to benefit from that, and they have to leave their neighborhood to make room for for millennials who now choose to live in the urban core. And I, I and what's yeah. interesting about that point, what's interesting about that point, uh, Paul, is uh, you get these black strivers, is what I call them, this black striver class of millennials who literally wish for the destruction of their own communities. I can't wait to see white people jogging. I can't wait for gentrification. So you got to college on the Thurgood Marshall Scholarship. You were pushed forward by the efforts of, of, of a Jackie Robinson at UCLA, but now your hope and your dream is some loophole lottery ticket answer. And I get to this and I, I almost ask you a personal question as a white person, especially as a younger white person than Rothstein. Rothstein's book has a second presumption than just talking about redlining. It presumes that we forgot the history. I pushed back on that and I told him, I believe that we were propagandized to remember a different history. And I used the Cosby Show and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, but I'm gonna focus on the Cosby Show. I did an article on it, Cosby Show Dreams, African-American Financial Realities. And I look at that home and that life and I just wonder how irresponsible it was to put that on TV, knowing the history of redlining in that neighborhood, in that city. We look at uh, the history of Trump and his family with uh, with subdivisions in, in New York. And I come to it and just ask, what was the impact of the Cosby show on you as a youth in terms of how you viewed race? And do you see this as when you tie it in with redlining, undermining the ability to have a, a serious discussion because people think of things racelessly? I come at the Cosby Show from, you know, I was, I, I, I'm from Appalachia, Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky, so I'm from White Poverty. I live in trailer parks and public housing uh, as a kid. You know, and I mean, I mean poverty where you have your lights cut off and your water cut off, like extreme poverty. I don't make that statement. A lot of people say they grew up poor, and I always ask them if they had their lights cut off because they're a litmus test that we had to, to find out how poor people are. So looking at the Cosby Show when I was a kid, I didn't see a lot of people on television living the way my parents lived and people in my community live uh, in general. Um, but I certainly see that I didn't see, uh, 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 and I lived in, 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 in black neighborhoods also, I didn't see black people uh, living the way the Cosby lived. But I think it was, I think it's irresponsible, and that goes back again to the intentionality behind uh, uh, sort of the, 
not acknowledging the tension intentionality behind these policies to call it the forgotten history uh which that's just not accurate uh these policies were not forgotten they were erased so i think i think a, a, that's my a, point a much better term would, would say that you say that you know there was a propaganda campaign to erase this history to forget something means that it was just, it just sort of slipped your mind you know, we knew this, and then all of a sudden we didn't know it. That's not really how it happened. And, and, you know, one of the things Mr. Austin said, I think it was in your interview, is that black people didn't know this history. I presented for two years in almost predominantly black neighborhoods to mostly black audiences. Black boomers were well aware of redlining. To, that's, that's ridiculous to think that they didn't know this was happening. They, they knew it was happening. Now, they might, have, they might not have had hard evidence uh, but that's how black communities have been gaslighted for, for decades also. They knew it was going on. They may not have had the smoke and gun, but, the, but they were well aware of it. And, and, I think, and, and, and I think generationally, so were black Gen Xers and black millennials. They, they knew these policies existed. See, I, I, the, thing I, the thing I would push back is that I think Gen Xers and millennials, particularly Gen Xers, were raised in a raceless America. The, the Cosby Show propaganda was one of the key elements. So many black people frame their identity of lawyers and doctors from Cliff and Claire Huxtable. And I think that the irresponsibility of what happened is we come back to that house. The, I, I mentioned it in the last show. They live in a home in 1983 that's worth $700,000 with five kids, one at Princeton, on a doctor and a lawyer salary. I'm, I don't even think people understand what money did back then. There were no billionaires. Um, there, there were just 100 millionaires and black people there was no, you know, Barry Gordy sells to EMI in the 90s. That's when you start seeing money above the table um, in terms of like black people having $100 million. So, so fundamentally, let's come back to it. That means that a black family put down $150,000 because you had to put 15% down back then. And they paid a mortgage that was like fifteen, sixteen thousand $16,000 in today's money. The, 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 the irresponsibility and the fantasticalness of this is just crazy. And it's only moved forward. You know, you have Shannon Dungy, head of, president of ABC uh, at the time that I, I did a, uh, a discussion on it. I talked to you about it before. She calls scandal, how to get away with murder, blackish. She calls that uh, wish fulfillment TV. Whereas on the other side, you look at uh, Roseanne. She says that's just everyday American TV. Roseanne lives in a house, $120,000 uh, you got blackish in a two million dollar house, so we start seeing it's not just forgotten. We need to propagandize that wealth has diversity, but we come back to it. Ninety percent of the wealth is in white hands. We come back to it. Ninety eight percent of the land is in white hands. You start to, you know, how insidious is it that that redlining wasn't taught as a present day reality? It was taught as a a past reality, and we see that with the color of law. Well, and I think that's still I think that's still the battle, even because you know now that you know a lot of in the last four or five years, redlining's really been discussed. The maps have been produced, they've been published, uh, and I think there's a real danger uh, in looking at it as history. And that's one of the things in my work that I really try to control that narrative to say. You know, anytime I speak publicly, it's to say this is we need to destroy any notion. And I use words like destroy very purposely. Uh, we need to destroy any notion that this is history. We do not need to look at this from a historical stance. We need to look at this in our daily lives and in our daily systems. And so I, I come to my last two questions. The uh, first is, uh, let's get specific. Can you explain the impacts of redlining using Louisville and blackness? I think one example you gave at the wonderful speech you did at the Angela Project was about a bus stop and you working for the Metro. Uh, but any example that you would like to use? Yeah, I use that example a lot sort of to explain how city planning works. And, you know, the purpose of city planning was really to, it was really weaponized to isolate and, 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 and you know, black communities. Uh, and, and, and by isolate, I mean cut them off from all resources. Contain is more of a colonial strategy. Uh, and, and it was really rooted in colonial ideology. And its purpose today is really to gentrify neighborhoods. So, um so what's happening in Louisville right now, you know, you have the Russell neighborhood, which is uh, um, Russell ranked really high in Opportunity Zone funding. And what Opportunity Zone funding is right now is a gentrification scheme. Neighborhoods rank high nationally if it appears that the black residents that live there can be displaced. And what you have around the country, you have groups like the Brookings Institution going to different cities around the country, telling them how to be competitive. 
right? And that's one of the things that drove the merger in Louisville. Louisville had a, a city-county merger around 2003 where the, the county and the city merged together. One of the drivers of that merger was that Louisville was getting ready to have a majority black city council. Um, but another driver of that was that the concentrated poverty for black people in Louisville was off the charts. So the Brookings Institution comes to town, and they say, you know, your concentrated poverty for black people is second in the country, right behind New Orleans. So this is pre-Katrina New Orleans. So it doesn't look good to Amazon. It doesn't look good to companies that want to locate here to have this kind of poverty right around downtown. So merger improved those numbers, right? The Brookings Institution comes back recently, and the census tracks around Louisville's urban core, uh, these are black neighborhoods, the median household income, Antonio, is $8,000 a year, right? We're not talking about $30,000 a year. We're talking about a census tract where the median household income is under 10000 So you're talking about extreme poverty. You don't see that kind of poverty except in Appalachia. You know, you're just some of the poorest places in the country. So the Brookings Institution, again, tells, you know, the city, you have to lift these census tracts out of poverty in order to be competitive as a city, right? And what that means is you've got to make this look better. It's not about challenging the social and political forces that create poverty or helping the people that live there. Though basically, those people have to go, and that's what you have in Louisville right now. And that's one of the it's it's kind of a continuation of the redlining policy that now you know the, the, these are people that live in public housing that live in the Beecher Terrace uh, uh, public housing that was created under these policies. Now that's being demolished. They're going to be scattered, you know, throughout the county in Section 8 housing, and reinvestment's going to come to that neighborhood, not to benefit the people in the neighborhood, but to their detriment. But let's get, let, let's get more specific. I want, I want to, I want to use uh, the last bit of time for specifically, I want to look at that bus stop example, because what I'm seeing now is cap is capital at the individual level is having problems with capital being innovative. And what I mean is, as an example, we have the rise of the limes and the, and, the, and the Uber scooters, and they hate those scooters. You know why? Because their little schemes about keeping black people out of their neighborhoods aren't working as well because people can just scooter into their neighborhood. And so, and you also see the same with Lyft, you know, because people can just take a Lyft instead of the, the bus. Whereas the bus, and can you give the example of the bus stop of how they how they played with the, the, the data? Yeah, so I, I think what you're talking about, I was working with a, with a young city planner, and we were looking at improving uh, bus stop in, infrastructure in the Russell neighborhood. And this is one of my last jobs as a public city planner. Uh, and, you know, the young man, uh, he, he, we walked, I mean, it was my, we actually walked uh, a few streets and did the inventory. The young man came back with his findings, and he said, you know, the bus stops are too close together. We need to make them farther apart so the bus can go faster. Is this the example you're talking about? Yes. Uh, and, and and I said, you know, they're too close together for you uh, because you're, you know, white male, 25 years old. You, you know, you, you had, you know, you, you slept until noon. You had a good lunch. But, you know, for the people that live in this neighborhood, they're riding the bus two to four hours every day. They're, they're, they're taking their kids to daycare. They're, they're stopping at the grocery store. You know, uh, uh, you know, they may be carrying groceries. They may have a baby. It may be raining. The stops may be adequately spaced for them. Um, and in trying to educate him about this, I realized that this is really not just a problem with city planning, but this is the problem with a lot of our public policies. There are colonial elements in this in, in, in this situation where this young man had never been to the Russell neighborhood, never spoke to anyone from the Russell neighborhood, uh, wasn't from Louisville, but he was given more power based on his expertise and his privilege and class to shape infrastructure in that neighborhood that people lived in, the people who lived there for decades. And what happens is, and this plays out on so many levels, Antonio, all over the country in every city, is that the people that live in that neighborhood that have lived there for decades wake up one day and their bus infrastructure has been changed. Or there's a bike lane in their neighborhood. Or, or the basketball court got demolished and they put in a dog park and they had no access to that process. It wasn't a, democrat, it wasn't a democratic process. It wasn't, it wasn't something that they, had, that they had input in. And that plays out on, on the on this largest scale down to the level of a bus stop. But it's playing out every day all over the country. And it's a trip. Before I go into the last question, a good friend of mine used the same, used a similar example of going to a theater that used to service blacks. And now all of a sudden there weren't blacks. And what you saw is that the theater had done subtle things like change the menu from chicken wings to uh, asparagus, you know, and, and to things that, you know, would make black people not want to actually sit and eat there. And, and, and it's all these 
tricks to actually keep whiteness in place and to keep privilege in place and, and you know, tricks of who's going to be considered black and, and, you know, where we're going to put descendants of slaves and, and how we're going to count like the data and how we're going to ignore the data. And I come to the biggest question of all about color of law, the book, because I, I was very, I, you know, my, my, my issue with Rossman came with the solution. Um, more so than anything is what is the solution? If any, I believe it takes reparations and honesty and reparations requires a, a entire repair about what race is in America. That's entire, that it requires us to confront that this America, this current America has decided that black people will hold the failure. And until you do deal with that, you can't get any progress on class or anything else. Yeah, and that's, I mean, and that's exactly it. When I was creating that, that story map of the redlining maps for you, every second that I worked on that, and I worked on it for years, every second uh, I was thinking, this may help. This, this, is my, this is my contribution to bring about reparation because I was cr trying to create a document that if you read the document, you could not walk away from it thinking that, that, that you know, you couldn't walk away from it without coming to the conclusion that we have to have reparations. And that's, and that's been the point of that work. Uh, and I think when we talk about solutions, it's really important to go back to the 60s uh, with, you know, when, when A. Philip Randolph wrote the Freedom Budget. And he was working with Martin Luther King Jr. And they were working on reparations and they were talking about that very openly. And then what happened after uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, then you get Nixon and then you get the rise of black capitalism yeah. and black entrepreneurs. And that, and that was sort of, and that was a race. But when I go back and I really study history and look for solutions, it was in that era with things like you know they had the freedom budget they had the, you know the, not just reparations in terms of uh, 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 monetary compensation but policy reparations long term uh, uh, policies that would redistribute wealth black back to black communities for black communities. Yeah, man, I, I just kind of wanted to have a brief discussion. Any last thing you want to say to the audience? I know you have a book that's gonna uh, set the world on fire in terms of redlining. But you're welcome to talk about that if you like or anything else. Uh, yeah, one of the things I've really been working on, you know, I'm a city planner and a community organizer, but I've really tried to, uh, I, I think I, I think we have to change our curriculums. And I've really kind of, I've set my sights on a lot of different uh, areas of focus, but city planning curriculums is, is one area because what, what's, what you were talking about earlier with, with, with incentivizing whiteness is really what city planners are trained to do. So we have to change those curriculums, and we have to have uh, more black people in planning and design professions. In 1968, uh, the head of the Urban League, National Urban League, Whitney Young, uh, had a conference that said we need more black architects and city planners. Really hasn't gotten that much better. And today, we have 452 black female architects in the United States. That's less than like 0.3%. And we don't know what kind of work they even get to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one of the things I'm really setting my sights on is working with young people, trying to get young people interested in design profession, interested in city planning, interested in creating maps. Because a lot of uh, when, you know, a lot of these a lot of these classes are being offered uh, at, 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 in middle school and high school in, in, in predominantly white neighborhoods. Black black schools don't get those those classes. They don't get those same opportunities. So there was a design justice profession in New Orleans in September of 2018. There was a black planners conference in October of 2018. So nationally, I think I think there's I think there's a paradigm shift that's getting ready to occur. Yeah, man. Well, man, I, I appreciate you coming on this Sunday, having this discussion. Um, I definitely think it'll be a productive one. I hope the audience enjoys it. Um, again, again, this is Tone Talks. Please subscribe and donate at tonetalks.org. Thank you so much.